Chapter 14, The Young Woman Surrounded in Light Back in Narsh, Tara, Edgar, Bannon, and Arvis had decided to proceed further in their plan of talking to Narsh's Esper, despite Locke and Sabin not being with them. It was turning into night outside, reminding them that time would not stop just so that their friends could join them. Arvis took the group of returners to the elder's home, to discuss with him the grave situation Narsh was in. I understand all of it, the elder said, and shook his head. But how can we be encouraging bloodshed? Well, I never said... That exactly. Arvis cried. Something like it. The elder said somewhat coldly. He is right, you know. Bannon interjected, and both Arvis and the elder looked surprised. Bannon! Arvis cried. Our blood will spill because of you. Bannon shouted at the elder, who backed up a few steps. Tara's gaze flitted nervously from one man to the other, and she could hear Edgar sigh. Emperor Gestal's racing to acquire Magitek power. He set his sights on the Esper that was found here. The increased use of Magitek power will surely lead to global destruction. Bannon glared at the elder. You see, in the end, it did not matter whether you refused to side with the Returners or not. You see now that the Empire will destroy you anyway. Your people will perish if you do not seek outside help, and we are willing to defend you. We just need to see that Esper. The Elder sighed and looked away, realizing the truth. The War of the Magi the mythical battle that set mankind back a thousand years. The elder half murmured to himself. Can this really be happening all over again? People will never learn. Myself included, I am afraid. Tara wrapped her arms around herself and tried to remain hopeful that the elder would come to his senses about what was happening. Brother. A voice suddenly called out. Edgar gasped and turned around. Tara blinked and clasped her hands together happily. Sabin! She exclaimed. Hi Tara! Sabin smiled, and made his way into the parlor of the elder's house from the hall. Long time no see, eh? You look great! Sabin! Tara cried, and suddenly surprised him with a hug. I am glad to say you look great as well. Thanks. Sabin grinned, and messed up her hair. As for you Edgar? Well? Ha ha, I'm just kidding. Did y'all miss me? Edgar smiled and put his hands on his hips. Sabin. I am glad you are safe. He said happily. He, like his brother sometimes had a hard time revealing his true emotions. But... Who is with you? Edgar peered at the two new faces standing behind Sabin. Gao! Gao! Gao exclaimed. He is a child we found on the veldt, but he packs a wallop in battle. Sabin explained. He's hard to understand sometimes, but his intentions are as good as gold. He calls himself Gao. Hi Gao. Tara smiled, and Gao ran over to her, taking her hand and kissing it like a little gentleman. What your name be? Gao asked Tara, whose cheeks were slightly pink. Tara. Tara exclaimed. And I'm Edgar, King of Figaro and Tara's handsome companion. Edgar noted icily. Edgar Sabin's brother. Gao questioned. Sabin tell us about you. You think girls love you. Does Edgar have mate? Erk. Edgar turned red and looked to Sabin, who tried not to laugh. And I am Cyan Garamond, retainer to the Lord of Doma. Cyan said, and bowed. I came to join your ranks as a returner after Doma was attacked. I am afraid there were no other survivors to join me, but... 
Oh. Tara sighed and brought a hand to her chest. Another place was attacked. The people of Doma were wiped out by the Empire. Sabin explained. Kefka. He poisoned. Everyone. Science squinted and tried to keep his eyes from watering. That's barbaric. The elder cried. Elder. Bannon exclaimed, wondering if he had decided to side with the returners after all. But it was only because Domo was collaborating with the Empire. The elder finished and shook his head. If Narsh makes that mistake. That's nonsense. Locke slammed the parlor door behind him and walked up to the group, a young woman at his side whose eyes slightly narrowed when she saw the rest of the group within the room. Cyan, again felt threatened by the woman's presence like he did back in Nikea in the bar, but somehow, this felt much more dangerous. Tara however, felt as if part of her memory had just been suddenly revived. I... I've seen her before. Somewhere. Tara thought. Half of her wanted to ponder her memory, but her other half was so anxious to see her other new friend back, that she put the thought in the back of her mind. Locke. Tara cried. We were all so worried about you. But of course. Who wouldn't be worried about the greatest treasure hunter of all time? Locke gave her a small smile but then quickly turned to the elder of Narsh. A reunion would have to wait. There were more critical issues at hand. The Empire is poised to attack Narsh at any moment. Locke announced. What? Edgar blinked. Hey, I was gonna say that. Sabin said, and snapped his fingers. Locke. Bannon said, and walked over to the young man who was now breathing heavily as a result of his end, Celeste's marathon run through Narsh to bring the news. Where did you hear this? This is Celeste's share. Locke said, and rested a hand on Celeste's shoulder, causing her to raise an eyebrow at him. She used to be one of the Empire's generals, and... An Imperial general. Tara blinked and thought harder now. Grr. Cyan cried, and pointed a finger at Celeste. I knew she seemed familiar. Sir Gao, out of my way. With that, Cyan shoved Gao aside roughly. Gao nearly toppled into Terra, causing her to squeal as Cyan marched over to Celeste and drew his blade. Shocked, Celeste cried out and backed up against the wall, but before Cyan could bring his sword to her neck, Locke leaped in front of him spreading out his arms so that he could not get past him. A gasp seemed to come out of every person's throat in the room at this sudden turn of events. Fool! Cyan shouted at Locke. This is General Celeste. She torched Miranda, Tsen, all of the southern continent villages. She's an imperial spy. Now, stand aside. Celeste brought a hand to Locke's arm and tried to pull it down. Locke, don't. She said, but Locke wouldn't move. Please wait. Locke said. Celeste has joined the returners. She's one of us now. But... Cyan was interrupted. I promised I would protect her. Locke said, this time in a firmer, more threatening tone. And I will not back out on my word. Celeste blinked in surprise, and slowly dropped her hand from his arm. Cyan looked disgusted, and Edgar sighed sadly. Locke. Are you still thinking about... That? He questioned, and Locke looked over to him. Tara felt that this situation was most uncomfortable but she realized that it was not fair that Celeste was being ridiculed for her former self, and she decided that no matter what, there should be no critical secrets between any of the returners. I was also an imperial soldier. 
Tara said, and Cyan turned on her. What? He cried. Tara hung her head in shame, but Edgar put a hand on her shoulder. The Empire is evil, but not all of its citizens are. He cried. Cyan still looked as if he were about to explode, and Sabin suddenly wondered if bringing him along was such a wonderful idea. Oh, this is just peachy. Sabin murmured to himself. The returners argue upon our reunion. Suddenly the parlor door flew open, and a disgruntled Narsh guard appeared. Emergency! He cried. The Empire cometh! Tara gasped, and Celeste crossed her arms over her chest. HMMPH! I'm not one to say I told you so, but... Just outside of Narsh, there was a loud commotion consisting of the ever-colorful Kefka and a good-sized group of his imperial soldiers, most of them accompanied by Ralphs and Dobermans, giant dogs that had been fused with Magitek power so that they could use magic and fight at command. They were all barking and howling, straining against the chain leashes that kept them from running through the city at will. Now listen to me! Kefka shrieked. I don't care what the hell you do here. Just get me that Esper. But Lord Kefka! A soldier cried. There are civilians here. Exterminate everyone! Kefka screeched. He had been having a bad day. First the Imperial base was raided by that muscle-headed idiot Sabin Figaro and his returner companions, then he had learned that General Celeste Cher, who was supposed to be put to death, had managed to escape her cell. Kefka had so been looking forward to executing her, too. But Narsh is neutral. Another soldier protested. Kefka suddenly let out an ear-piercing shriek and sent a ball of fire streaking at him. The soldier gasped and managed to duck out of the way just in time. The fireball smashed into a snowbank behind him and made a loud hissing noise as it was put out by the chilly snow. Idiots, read my lips! Kefka bellowed. Dispose of anyone who opposes us. Now march! Oh dear! Tara thought to herself as she looked about the room. Everyone had proceeded to argue with one another. Cyan was going on and on about how Sabin didn't mention there were imperial traitors within the returners, Sabin was protesting that he didn't feel it was necessary, and that he didn't even know about Celes. Then he started yelling at Sabin for trying to kill Celes in the first place, even if she did seem suspicious. I am not a spy. Celes growled. Leave her alone. Locke snapped. Uwaiulu! Gao moaned. Can't you keep quiet, jungle boy? Edgar cursed in irritation. He knew why Locke had brought Celes along. Edgar, keep your temper! Locke said calmly. He's a boy. No more a boy than you. Edgar replied coolly, and Locke shot him a dirty look. Oh please! Locke said sarcastically. This is coming from the man who is a skirt chaser. I don't even think Gao does that. Gao blinked, Edgar turned scarlet, and Tara gulped. This could not go on. Everyone! She cried, and suddenly the commotion stopped. Tara looked at everyone and pressed her lips together for a moment, trying to gather what she was going to say. We are all returners, Tara began, and turned pink when she noticed everyone's attentions were now totally focused on her. And now we know that Celeste was right, that Narsh is going to be attacked, and soon, if we don't protect the Esper here in Narsh, all our work up to this point will be for nothing. All of the sacrifices we, and other kingdoms even, 
have made. She looked directly at Cyan when she said that. It will all be wasted. We cannot let Kefka get that esper, or even threaten Narsh in any way. Her voice got louder as she reached the last part of her speech. I was once afraid, but now, I am willing to fight. Kefka is the man who stole my very memories from me. He has stolen something precious from all of you as well, I can only assume. Or else, you wouldn't be here, would you? So tonight, we must not only fight for Narsh, but for ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to put aside our own differences. Ever since I have been with Locke, Edgar, and Sabin, I have seen over and over again how teamwork and faith in your friends can get you through anything. Tara sighed. Truthfully, this faith is all I have right now. But, it is enough. Oh Tara! Locke murmured. You, truly are our ray of hope. Bannon smiled happily. You're right Tara. Edgar said firmly, and smacked his fist into his open hand. We've got a fight for Narsh. The Returners will defend anyone who is attacked by the Empire. You see, Elder? We are willing to fight for you. Bannon said, and the Elder nodded. I see how it is. The Elder said, and sighed some. We've moved the Esper into the Snow Hills so that it isn't in such a confined area. However, there are three paths that go up the hill it is resting on, so it could be attacked at several angles. We can get around that. Tara said. We'll just divide ourselves into three groups, and defend each path from Kefka's troops. Good idea Tara. Edgar said. All right. So we can have two groups of two, and one group of three. He determined, counting the heads in the room, except for Bannon, who still had not properly recovered from the trip to Narsh and was in no condition to fight. Celeste, I could use your magic power. Will you fight by my side? Locke asked, and Celeste looked up at him. She noticed that for some reason, his cheeks were slightly pink. Of course Locke, she said, and smiled some. Magic. Tara blinked. I felt it, that familiar aura. So she can use magic as well. I must ask her about that later. I want to be with my brother. Edgar decided. Tara, want to join us too? All right. Tara exclaimed. Well. I guess that leaves me and Sir Gao. Cyan said, and rested his hand on Gao's shoulder. Quite excellent. I shall see how much of a warrior you really are. Uwaiuo. Gao moaned. Me hungry. We can all eat after the battle. Tara assured him. We'll have a feast together. Feast, feast, Gao fight for feast. Gao cheered, jumping up and down. Well, with our objective in mind, let's prepare for battle. Locke said half-jokingly. It's going to be a really long night. The team of returners all strapped on Narsha's finest armor they had to offer and were all furnished with new weapons from the shops for free. Tara, Edgar, and Cyan all received shining new blades. Locke got a new dagger, Sabin was equipped with a special pair of knuckles with claws at each end, and Celeste sheathed her runic blade temporarily for a metal-laced whip. Gao insisted that he needed no weapon. His own powers would be revealed shortly, it seemed. However, there was no time to gather winter clothing for the cold weather outside, so after equipping themselves, the team left the elders' house to march up the hill to the Esper. The winds were cold and seemed to bite at everyone's skin, and snow was beginning to blow down in furious flurries. 
Edgar seemed to be the only one who was somewhat content in his heavy-layered royal garb. He looked back for a moment and saw Celeste walking along, clasping each side of her cape with her hands to keep it pulled over her shoulders and arms. She was staring down at the ground, watching each footstep her boots made in the snow. Edgar grinned to himself. She was quite gorgeous, just like Tara. How lucky he was that all of the female returners were total babes. He then remembered Locke though, and thought for a moment. It was time for him to find out something. Edgar stopped walking for a moment and waited for Celeste to catch up with him. When she finally reached him, instead of looking up to him to see what he wanted, she merely continued on. Edgar sighed exasperatedly and fell into step beside her. Finally. Celeste looked up from her shoes and narrowed her eyes at Edgar. Yes? She asked. Edgar smiled innocently. You know? Locke has a complicated past. He began, and Celeste raised her eyebrows. I... Uh... Wouldn't want to think he's fallen for you or something. Celeste looked confused for a moment, but that was soon replaced with an icy smirk that sent chills down Edgar's spine. And what do you mean by that? She asked coolly. I am a soldier, not some love-starved twit. Edgar blinked and got a little angry. So she didn't care about Locke after all, it seemed. Edgar could only pray that his suspicions regarding Locke's feelings were wrong as well. Cold as ice. He muttered, and Celeste shook her head. I don't know why you care. She replied. If Locke has a complicated past, that is his business. He has not shared anything with me. And if Locke has fallen for me. Well. Celeste sighed and looked away so that Edgar couldn't see her face. Don't bring this up anymore. She demanded, and with that, picked up her pace and walked away. Edgar stared after her and crossed his arms over his chest. Sheesh! Celeste rolled her eyes and walked up to Tara, who was shivering and rubbing her arms, walking alone also. She looked back to Celeste and put on a weak smile, as if the cold were nothing. Hello Celeste! She said cheerfully. Hi Tara! Celeste said. So? You were a soldier for the Empire. I can't say I recognize you though. I'm afraid I can't even remember you. Tara admitted. However, I am sure that I may after I get my memories back. So you have amnesia? Celeste shook her head. And yet... You can still use your magic? How I would love to be able to forget that I could. Magic. Such a lovely gift. Celeste's voice filled with bitterness and contempt. You can use magic too. Tara asked. When I was a baby, I was artificially infused with magic and raised as a magitech knight. Celeste replied. I had no parents, no friends. Tara sighed and suddenly touched her hand to Celeste's cape, making Celeste peer at her. Tara took a deep breath. I am sure my past must somehow be similar to Celeste. But, even though we were both in the Empire, we are like two completely different people. If I could remember the Empire, would I be like Celeste? A new question arose in her mind, making her feel nervous. If I get my memories back, will I be able to feel love? Any emotion other than fear and hate? Celeste, have you ever loved someone? Tara suddenly asked, and Celeste made a face, pulling away from Tara. What is that supposed to mean? She shrieked and Tara shook her head frantically. Oh no, I mean, 
I don't think I mean it the way you think I mean it. I mean... Oh dear. Tara covered her eyes in embarrassment. I just meant... Well... Have you ever... Loved someone? Been in love? Something like that. Celeste thought about it for a moment, and was about to answer, when Cyan looked back at them from further up and glared heavily. Tara didn't seem to notice, but Celeste did. Cyan narrowed his eyes and mouthed silently, Don't think for a moment that I trust you. Celeste narrowed her eyes in reply, and mouthed back, Fine. Use your own eyes, and then decide. With that, she forgot what she was going to say to Tara. Tara took the silence as a hint, and did not mention it again. At last, the returners reached the destined battlefield, without any more confrontations with each other. Where is the Esper? Tara questioned, not seeing it. A little further up north. Bannon explained. This is the only place we can fight that is not too tight. Ha 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 ha. Kefka. Tara cried, and peered down the hill through the falling snow which was getting heavier and heavier. There, standing at its base, was Kefka, his capes flapping violently in the wind, surrounded by several soldiers and growling, barking dogs that were digging in the snow with their paws to try to escape their leashes. At last, we meet again, my returner friends. Kefka laughed delightedly, and Tara suddenly felt so overwhelmed with the fear of his presence that she nearly collapsed in the snow. Celeste marched over to Tara's side and suddenly took her in her arms, holding her up straight as she glared down at Kefka. You won't win Kefka! Celeste cried, and Kefka put his hands on his hips. Oh ho! It's General Celeste, the traitor! So this is where you dragged your beaten ass. You were better off where you were, my dear. Never. Celeste screamed. I won't lose to the Empire again. Hee hee, this should be fun. Kefka squealed, and pointed towards the returners. Go, get them. The Esper should be around here somewhere. Bring it to me immediately. Our Emperor is waiting. Mwahahahaha. With that, the soldiers released their hold on the dogs, and they bolted straight up the paths on the hill towards the group. The soldiers began to follow them, and Kefka remained at the base of the hill, waiting. Come on guys! Locke cried. Let's fight them off before they get up here. For the returners! Edgar exclaimed, and Tara turned to Celeste. Thanks! Tara said tiredly, and Celeste shook her head. Go down and fight with your team. Celeste said. You can't be afraid. With that, Celeste ran down the hill, and Locke scrambled after her. Tara sighed and drew sword as Edgar and Sabin came over to her. Ready? Edgar asked, and Tara nodded. Look out! Sabin cried, and a giant Ralph which resembled a large bulldog that was plated in metal, by the way, suddenly took a leap at the team. Tara screamed and thrust out her hands. Fira! With that, streams of flame shot from Tara's hands and struck the Ralph down in midair. It howled in agony and collapsed to the ground, where it disappeared. Tara let out a sigh of relief, not giving herself any time to celebrate the learning of the new spell. She charged down the left path of the hill, and Sabin and Edgar ran after her. They encountered a few more Ralphs and Dobermans, which didn't put up much of a fight as Tara fried each one. Meanwhile, Cyan and Gao were taking on their own pack of creatures. Cyan found that his blade worked very inefficiently against their metal bodies though, and he became exhausted after wiping out only two Ralphs. Sir Gao, what are we to do? Cyan huffed as another pair started to run towards them. Gao no! Gao exclaimed, and with that, 
took a flying leap on top of one of the Ralphs, riding its back. Cyan cried out and drew his blade once more. Sir Gao, what a foolish plan! Cyan said worriedly. It will throw you off. But to Cyan's surprise, the Ralph, instead of charging and bucking its body to throw off Gao, stopped as if paralyzed. When Gao jumped off of it, it flopped over in the snow silently, dead. As it disappeared, its partner began to make its advances on the party. Cyan widened his eyes on the unharmed Gao. What did you do? Cyan cried, and Gao suddenly let out a loud growl, not replying, and dived onto the other Ralph. He began pounding against it with such strength that the armored plates that made up its skin began to bend inwards and dent horribly. Cyan took this chance and slashed his blade down the Ralph's side, cutting it open with the mortal blow. The dog disappeared moments later to join its partner. With that, Gao blinked and began to dance excitedly. We win! Sir Gao! Cyan cried. Whatever possessed thou to release such strength? Gao borrow strength from first Ralph! Gao exclaimed, and Cyan blinked confusedly. Gao use special attack leap! Gao tried to explain. Gao absorb monster ability and use it as his own. Beat enemy fast! Gao no hear Cyan while leaping though. Gao can't help that. Gao say sorry in advance. Hmm. I see. Cyan nodded and stroked his mustache. You can use a monster's abilities against itself in battle. But in exchange you go berserk and sacrifice your free mind. What an incredible power you have. Uwaiulu. Gao cheered, happy that Cyan somewhat approved of his abilities. Cyan come. Many more monster to beat. Crack. Ah. Celeste yanked back her whip as the soldier she struck with it collapsed to the ground, knocked out. Locke finished off another soldier that he was fighting, thrusting his dagger into his stomach and pulling it out roughly as the soldier screamed for the gods to take him away from it all. He fell to the ground also, on top of his partner. Hey, will you? Locke panted and wiped away the blood trailing down his forehead. Did he get you? Celeste asked. Only a bit. Locke admitted. But I haven't seen anyone lay a hand on you yet. Just be quiet and hold still. Celeste sighed, and used a cure spell to recover Locke's stamina so that his cut would heal faster. Thanks. Locke smiled warmly. In reply. Celeste narrowed her eyes at him and suddenly raised her whip high above her head to strike. Celeste! Locke screamed. What are you doing? Locke, duck! Celeste cried, and Locke didn't waste any time doing that as Celeste took a leap and struck down an imperial soldier trying to sneak up on Locke from behind with a poised blade. The soldier grunted and fell, defeated, and Locke looked behind him his heart about to leap out of his chest from the mixture of shock and relief. Thanks, he said, and pulled himself back up, but Celeste glared at him. You thought I was going to hit you? She stated firmly, and Locke couldn't mask the truth in his eyes. Well, uh, you did make me kinda nervous. Locke began and Celeste put her hands on her hips. You don't trust me after all. Locke shook his head quickly and looked up into her eyes so that she knew he was telling the truth. No, I do trust you Celeste. It's just that. Forget it. Celeste said, and began to walk on ahead. Their path was now clear of monsters and soldiers, and Celeste could see everyone else finishing off the last of the enemies on their paths as well. She sighed when she looked up ahead and saw Kefka standing with his back to the battle scene. Celeste wait up! Locke demanded as he walked towards her, but suddenly, there was a final clash of swords, and the last soldier Kefka had fell. 
Locke and Celeste looked over, and saw that Cyan had just finished him off. Kefka suddenly twitched, as if anticipating this, and slowly turned around. The silence around the hill was only interrupted by the shrill whistling of the wind every few minutes or so. When Kefka turned around fully, he opened his eyes, and scanned them along the battlefield. However, when he saw that it was the returners standing, and not his troops, he instantly turned red and began to jump up and down, screaming. He's throwing a fit! Tara cried nervously. Arg! Kefka howled. This is our I goddamn ridiculous. How dare you oppose the Empire? How dare you oppose me? This is the end for you. Say your prayers. With that, Kefka pointed a finger toward the group and shouted, Confuse! Runic! Celeste cried, and managed to absorb the spell just before it struck all of the returners and reduced them to a puppet state with Kefka pulling the strings. She fell to her knees and took in a deep breath, trying to recover from the large spell absorption as quickly as she could manage. Tara swallowed her fear and looked to Kefka, who was smiling like a maniac. K-E-F-K-A! She suddenly screamed, and ran after him. Kefka turned and looked to Tara at the wrong moment she took a leap and dove on top of him, throwing him to the ground, feathers from his many hair pieces flying everywhere. Tara! Locke cried. Go to her before she does anything stupid. Celeste moaned. Locke nodded and ran over to Tara, who was struggling to pin Kefka to the ground. Edgar and Sabin followed, while Gao and Cyan remained behind just in case. Why did you do it? Tara cried as Locke approached her. Why did you take my memory away? Why are you making others suffer so? Why? Kefka could only laugh for the first few moments of his reply. Oh my dear, you couldn't even begin to comprehend why. It is far beyond any knowledge you might have of anything. The little that you have, that is. Ha 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 ha. With that, Kefka grunted and blasted Tara off of him with a fire spell. She cried out as she flew backwards and landed in a pile of snow non-moving. You bastard! Locke growled. What are your true intentions, Kefka? Edgar demanded. My true intentions? You have no use of those. Kefka snapped, standing up. It is the Empire you have to worry about for now. What do you mean by that? Sabin questioned softly, and Kefka smirked. If he will not reply, then finish him off. Edgar demanded, and with that, shot at Kefka with his auto crossbow. However, each of the steel arrows struck at a yellow barrier that appeared around Kefka, and fell to the ground. He laughed manically as Edgar gasped and dropped the crossbow in surprise. A, -A barrier! Locke cried. It's a simple magic trick. Kefka smirked. Let me show you. Thundara. Kefka raised his hands in the air, and five lightning bolts struck from the dark sky, striking Locke, Edgar, Sabin, Cyan, and Gao. They all cried out in unison and collapsed to the ground. Locke moaned and tried to push himself up, but it was like his body couldn't comprehend his mind's demands, and he did not move. Gao no move. Gao cried shrilly. My body feels as if it's gone numb. Cyan whimpered. I've paralyzed you all so that you will stay for my last trick I'm going to show you. Kefka smirked. I'm still touching up on it a bit, but I'm sure that either way, the results will be beautifully devastating. Hee <laughs> hee. Kefka got in his spell casting stance once more, and Locke struggled to get up again tears forming at the corners of his eyes in frustration. He couldn't let it end here. Fira! Blizzara! Suddenly, two beams of sparkling red and blue light shot at Kefka from behind where Locke, Edgar, and Sabin were lying. 
both collided into him at once and caused a fantastic blinding white explosion, making Locke and the others close their eyes. Kefka let out a shriek, and all of a sudden, the feeling rushed back into the fallen returner's legs and arms. Locke blinked and stood up, looking himself over. He was a little damp from the snow, but otherwise unharmed. You guys, I can move again! Locke exclaimed. The smoke around Kefka's form had not yet begun to clear. Edgar and Sabin both looked at each other and stood up, confused. Cyan and Gao also got up, and looked around. Where's Tara and Celeste? Cyan cried. They're gone. Right here. A pair of voices exclaimed. Everyone turned and saw Tara and Celeste materialize out of thin air behind Locke, Sabin, and Edgar. Locke blinked and nearly fell back over. Whoa! Edgar cried. Where did you come from? It's a spell Celeste just taught me. Tara explained. An invisibility spell, to be exact. We're sorry you had to wait to so long, but I had to wake Tara up. Celeste said. And... Erg. A soft moan suddenly emitted from Kefka's lips. The returners turned around all stared as Kefka pulled himself up from the snow. Water was dripping from his hair and head pieces, flame had scorched his robes in several places, and eyes clung to them in others. A small trickle of blood ran down from the corner of his mouth. His tongue then slowly slipped out between his lips and licked at it, making him break into a smile. Kefka! Tara trailed off, and pushed past the others to face him. Don't think you've won! Kefka smirked. I won't forget this! With that, Kefka violently pulled his tattered cloak over his face and body. Seconds later, he disappeared. No. Tara cried. Come back. It's no use. Edgar said, and shook his head. But. At least the Esper is safe. No, it's not. Sabin cried. We won't know it is safe until we see it for ourselves. Let's hurry, in case Kefka tried to teleport up to it. With that. The returners ran back up the hill and shouted to Bannon that they were going to see the Esper. Bannon told them he was going to return to Arvis's house and share the news that the Empire had been driven out of Narsh. I feel as if I have been here before. Tara told Locke and Edgar as they began to reach more stable and elevated ground. Perhaps you have. Locke replied. Maybe you'll remember something. The returners soon found themselves on a high cliff that looked out right over Narsh. Below, the dim lights of the town stood out like fireflies, as the sky was very dark and there was no moon. Tara narrowed her eyes so that she could see better, and led the group until she spotted something glittering at the edge of the cliff a few feet ahead of her. She gasped. This is it. She cried, and pointed. The Esper. The Esper was still as she had found it the first time, although she didn't remember that particular detail. The ice that encased it was no thinner, but it was glittering with an eerie light that was all of its own. I have seen this before. Tara thought to herself. As soon as I saw it, I knew it was the Esper that we had been fighting to protect this whole time. I can see its eyes through the ice. Shining. Is it alive? Is it still alive? Cyan asked right then, as if reading Tara's thoughts. Impossible. Right. Sabin replied nervously. Tara shrugged and began to approach it, very slowly so that she didn't frighten it. Tara, come back here. Edgar said. Or do you see something? No. I hear something. It wants me to come nearer. It just asked me to. Didn't Edgar or the others hear it? 
Tara? Sabin cried. Wait. Wait. Sabin, I can't wait. Tara. Celeste cried, and reached out to grab Tara by the arm. However, when she did, sparks flew, and Celeste screamed, pulling her hand back. Tara had begun to glow with a pale blue light. The same the Esper was emitting. Celeste. Oh no, why can't I stop my legs? It's as if they are being driven by another force. I can't stop. The Esper. I can't look away from its eyes. No. Tara suddenly screamed. Tara, what is it? Locke asked worriedly. Right then, a deep growl came from the frozen Esper, and a white and blue bolt of electricity shot out from the ice striking the ground. The force was so tremendous that it threw everyone to the ground, except for Tara, who had finally stopped a few feet in front of the Esper. Locke struggled to pull himself closer to Tara, for he was near the edge of the cliff. Tara and the Esper? Sabin moaned. There's some kind of reaction. Edgar finished. With that, another bolt of light shot out from the Esper this time striking Tara right in the head. Although Tara was not affected at all, the ground shook again violently, and Locke was thrown off the side of the cliff. Ah! Locke screamed, but suddenly felt strong hands grasp his own. When he looked up, he saw Celeste staring down at him worriedly, her hands locked with his. The ground began to shake with more and more tremors as she struggled to pull him back onto the cliff. What? Tara cried, seemingly at the Esper. What am I feeling? What's going on? Please. Tell me. Who am I? Who? Tara. Locke cried as he swung his second leg back on the cliff surface, now no longer hanging from it. The Esper. Celeste closed her eyes for a moment. I can feel it. I can actually feel its mind. Feel its mind? Cyan demanded. I have Esper cells within my body because of my magic. Celeste explained. They are apparently reacting to the Esper's light. Then what is going to happen to Tara? Edgar cried. Tara. Please, if you can hear me. Step away from the Esper. But it was too late. The sky filled with more and more beams of the Esper's white light. As they descended down to the cliff, they began to circulate into a blur around Tara's body. The hair in her ponytail flew up straight from the violent wind that was emitted by the light, blowing back everyone's hair who was watching the spectacle. All the returners were forced to close their eyes as the light got brighter and brighter and swallowed up Tara more and more. Moments later, she was completely enveloped within it, and the Esper suddenly stopped shining. Silence befell the cliffside. Celeste moaned and brought a hand to her forehead, which was pounding with pain. Slowly, she opened her eyes, and looked about her surroundings. Locke had passed out in her lap probably from the shock of the Isper's light and almost falling off the cliff. Edgar was slowly struggling to sit up and regain his senses, and Gao was whimpering in fright. Everyone else seemed to be out of it. Celeste and Edgar looked at each other. What happened? Edgar asked. I do not know. Celeste replied, and bit her lip. She looked back down at Locke and then up to the point of the cliff where Tara had been with the Esper. However, what she saw made her blood run cold. She would have screamed if her voice had not been caught within her throat. She knew Edgar had seen it too from his surprised gasp. There, standing in Tara's place, was a figure about her same size and body structure. However, this thing was covered in a soft white light and had skin the color of powder. Its long, somewhat spiky hair was also the same color as its skin, and its eyes glowed with a ruby-red gleam. 
What surprised Edgar and Celeste the most though was that it was wearing the same pendant Tara had always worn. A golden chain with a garnet stone. Tara? Edgar asked cautiously. At the sound of that name, the creature suddenly let out an ear-piercing scream and shot upwards into the sky like a rocket. It made circles around the cliff top several times before letting out one last scream, and with a burst of light, shot away from the cliff top, away from Narsh, and into the very distant southwestern mountains, like a shooting star. The frozen esper remained, still trapped in ice, no longer glowing at all. It was as if time had been stopped by the white creature, and now it was being restored. The cold winds of Narsh picked up again and blew into the returners, making some of the fainted ones stir. Celeste pulled Locke's body closer to her and blew her bangs out of her eyes. Tara had disappeared. No, not disappeared. Flown away. 15. A Soul Trapped in Time Rachel of Cullen Chapter End